Right, uh, start warming up to start now. There's a couple of things I have to say before we start. One is I've been asked to bring to your attention there's a, a lecture on Tuesday next week, the 17th of January, uh, in the Leonard Deacon Theatre, uh, which is... Uh, it's actually not next week. Yeah, next week. Uh, uh, which is um, someone from the... Institute Pasteur, Patrice Corvalet, is coming to talk about evolution and dissemination of vancomycin resistance. So it's one of those kind of eminent lectures which the medical school and the university has from time to time. To time. Um, it's up the road in the Leonard Deakin. Uh, you were in the original timetable, so there was a slot for this module then, but actually that's now a spare slot. So I know that you will be free at least from 11.30 to 12, or whether you're free from 12 to 12.30, I don't know. But, but I've just been asked to bring that to your attention. I can't actually go myself, but if you're interested uh, in this subject, it'd be worth going to that. Second point of order is I apologise for the fact that we've only got a few handouts today. The printer's packed in on me. I sent a print run, but it, it only did like the first five, and then it packed in. I will bring a full set of handouts tomorrow, so you'll have handouts for both lectures tomorrow. The other thing uh, I just want to check, because I'm not really so sure of your backgrounds, how many of you have done genetics in the past? A few, and, but quite a few of you haven't. It's unclear to me how to pitch this lecture at what level. So those of you who have done genetics, if I'm insulting your intelligence with some of the things, I apologise. For those of you who haven't done genetics, if we're going too fast, I apologise, but you know, we have to try and keep both sides going. So today's lectures on um, the genetics of bacterial virulence would include a little bit of background to uh, bacterial genetics more generally. As with yesterday's lecture, making a slide cast of this so it will be available on the web uh, fairly soon. So just to reorient you, we're in the second lecture now of these introductory lectures and you're going to get later lecture blocks uh, on genomics and protein secretion. And, uh, oh, that is wrong, isn't it? That's uh, cut and pasted from the other lecture, and I didn't actually update the learning objective, so we'll just ignore that. Right, let's start with uh, kind of orientating ourselves. Some of you may have come across human genetics. We've spent a lot of time on eukaryotic cell biology, and we just have to remind you that bacteria are actually different. Uh, so in bacteria we generally have a single circular DNA chromosome. There are a few exceptions. There are some bacteria where we have two chromosomes, um, but those are the exception rather than the rule. Most of the time we have a single circular chromosome. Sometimes we do, there's a few bacteria that have linear chromosomes as well, but again, those are the exceptions. Many bacterial cells will also, in addition to the chromosome, contain other what we call replicons, replica, self-replicating DNA uh, molecules, particularly plasmids, uh, usually circular but sometimes can be linear molecules, are separate from the chromosome, usually an order or two of magnitude smaller than the chromosome in size as well. There are no, none of the histones that you get in eukaryotic chromosomes, no nucleosomes, all that kind of stuff. There are these... Um, histone-like molecules you get in bacteria that bind to DNA, but they're completely unrelated in terms of evolution and so forth to the histones you see in eukaryotes. There's no nucleus, there's no nuclear membrane in bacteria. You get a coupling of transcription and translation in the same compartment of the cell uh, in, in the cytoplasm. So there's not that separation that you get uh, with um, eukaryotes. There's no mitosis or meiosis. And the other th key point is that with bacteria, we don't have introns, uh, except in very rare exceptions. Uh, there are some introns have been described, in, particularly in ribosomal genes in, in bacteria, but they're very unusual. Um, and they're not quite the same as you get in, um, in, in eukaryotes. And genes often come in clusters of related functions controlled as, as a unit called the operon, and we'll say more about that in a moment. 
those of you who've just arrived, uh, just, I just explained that the handout will come tomorrow for this lecture because we had a problem with the printer. Uh, so there were a few handouts, but not the full complement. Right, so one of the things that you, you, you can kind of relate to with the bacterial genome is what you see is what you get. It's very much simpler and more straightforward and intuitive than what you get when you look at eukaryotic genomes. So here is a kind of genome that you could wear on a T-shirt, if you like, the way a view of it. This is a circular view of a, a genome. This is actually Campylobacter jejuni, uh, uh, one particular bacterium, one of the earliest ones to be genome sequenced. And on this circular view here, you've got these little uh, lines coming here, ten, uh, uh, coming up, uh, where uh, there is a gene present uh, on one strand or another. Um, and this is coloured according to GC content, which we mentioned in the first lecture. And you can see that generally the GC content is pretty much even throughout the genome. There are just a few places where it varies. Behind there is a, a view of the same genome. And here you have genes shown as blocks, coloured in by function. Um, and the ones that lie above the line are on one strand, genes encoded on one strand, the ones that know the lie below the line are on the other strand. Now, I, I think it's fairly striking, should strike you from the back of the room, that this genome is very densely coding. These are all protein coding genes here. And so there is no junk DNA here. There's no, there's no mess, stuff messing around that, that you don't, don't know what it does, kind of dark matter. Pretty much... Well, over 80%, 80, 85% of the genome is actually coding sequence, protein coding sequence. You can see it ground full here, which is quite different from what you see when you look at, say, a mammalian genome. Now, these are the bits where I, this is a kind of catch-up for people who haven't done genetics, and the people who have already done genetics, you can sleep for a little bit, think about what you're going to cook for dinner tonight or whatever. So let's just quickly go through some of these terms as a catch-up. So... What is a gene? In, in, in bacterial terms, we're looking at the smallest region of DNA. Uh, it's got RNA there because we might talk about viruses, but we're not going to talk about viruses in this course. But encodes a polypeptide or is transcribed or is a regulatory element. Now, we used to think that, yeah, it's actually quite straightforward in bacteria that genes are you know, mostly protein coding and then it's a ribosomal RNAs, tRNAs, that sort of stuff. In fact, we now recognize there are lots of small RNAs that are transcribed in bacteria which don't code for proteins but do actually have regulatory roles. So we're seeing a similar theme as to what you see. I mean, this is a big theme in eukaryotic genetics at the moment, but it also is happening with, with bacteria. So the definition of a gene is actually quite fuzzy, uh, in, in, even in bacteria. We use the term locus to describe the location of a gene on the chromosome often refers to a group of related genes with related functions. So, for example, the trip locus uh, is uh, several genes that are uh, clustered together and they're all involved in the biosynthesis, biosynthesis of the uh, amino acid tryptophan. Uh, and the plural of locus is loci, uh, which is, is just Latin. Allele uh, are various alternative forms of a gene, uh, different sequences. The wild-type organism, which is the organism which carries a standard reference gene, uh, which is usually, uh, but not always functional. Sometimes a wild type might have a, you know, a gene that's actually not functional because it's carrying some historical baggage. But generally, that's not the case. Mutant organism, we have the mutant gene. We have a genotype describing the composition of the strain in terms of the genetic allelic composition, so which genes have got which alleles, which genes have been knocked out, which genes might have insertions, and then the phenotype, the observable properties of the strain. Mutations, obviously permanent heritable change in the DNA. Mutant is an organism or cell that's carrying a, a mutation. Uh, and we have forward mutations where we go from wild type phenotype to something that's different, to a mutant phenotype. And then you can get backward mutations or reversions where you get a restoration of the wild type phenotype through a mutation. The term genome is the entire genetic complement. It includes the chromosome or chromosomes, as I say, there are a handful of organisms where there are multiple chromosomes, 
and all the plasmids as well. So when we say we sequence a genome, we have to say, you know, we actually carry, including all those plasmids, that's part of the genome. How much of this is familiar to you? So I, do I need to go faster or slower? Faster, yeah, okay, right. So you're familiar with genetic des designations for genes in bacteria? Anyone not familiar with this? Wants us to go through it. You know, so basically there's uh, three letters for the gene and then a, a symbol for which, for the locus and then a symbol for which particular gene in that. And you have these various uh, modifications, uh, you know, different uh, mutations. You have knockouts, delta, RSC, 43 is a deletion in RSC. There's an insertion. You put these double colons to illustrate that there's been an insertion there. Uh, and the phenotypic designation is the same as the genetic designation, apart from that it's not italicized or underlined. And uh, you start with a, uh, a capital letter, but you don't underline it or, or use italics. Uh, and we have resistance with a, a superscript of there, or in terms of superscript S or R, superscript to determine whether it's just or whatever. Now, all that you might say, oh yeah, that's all fine. But when you actually mash all this together and give a genetic designation for a strain, it actually starts to look a bit complicated. So if you go and look in a, a manual uh, where you, uh, you're ordering a certain strains that you want to use in your genetic uh, manipulation experiment, you'll see these kind of designations where you have a number of mutations strung along one after another. So this has got a mutation in the trip E locus, 30, mutation number 38, mutation 139 in RFD. Got an insertion in LAM B of TN10. Uh, you may also see whether in these designations it will say whether it has lambda present or not, or some other phage, prophage present or not in the genome. Um, and so these designations, you know, they sometimes can, la can, can be the length of a whole line or two in, in the text because there's so many things that have been changed in a particular strain to make it useful uh, in, in terms of uh, molecular biology. Now, we've already mentioned this yesterday just to reinforce the point that we have uh, three ways in which DNA gets around. Horizontal gene transfer is uh, a very dominant theme uh, in the evolution of many bacterial lineages. Not all. There are some lineages which become isolated and don't take in new DNA. But in many parts of the bacterial world, horizontal gene transfer is a very important uh, and, uh, and dominant factor. Uh, quite unlike what you see in mammalian genetics, where we don't start acquiring genes from elephants or E. coli or anything like that. We, our genomes uh, tend to be pretty stably passed on uh, from one species to another. So. But you have uh, plasmids or chromosomes via conjugation, you have naked DNA via, uh, via transformation, and you have, uh, on a bacteriophage, you have transduction, either so-called generalized transduction, where the bacteriophage packages up bits of the whole chromosome and, and then injects them into another cell, or specialized, where it takes genes uh, along for the ride uh, which have a role in virulence. And this is just, again, to reinforce what we said yesterday. We have all these mobile genetic elements, transposons, virulence plasmids, phages, and pathogenicity islands. So that's a very quick whistle-stop tour just to reinforce some of the basics of genetics. Just going to pause for thought now and ask a question about evolution, if you like. So where do all these virulence genes originate from in terms of how do you get from a non-pathogen to a pathogen? Where does it get those uh, genes from? How do they originate? How does the pathogenic lifestyle come about? And do we expect to see virulence factors, things that we consider virulence factors in things that are infecting us and causing clear and present disease in us, in things that aren't pathogens? And if we do see that, why do we see that? Well, 
uh, uh, a few years ago, I put forward this idea with a friend of mine that we should actually be looking at what we call an eco-evo perspective. If people tend to just look at the bacteria in front of them. You know, this is anthrax. Is Bacillus anthracis causing anthrax? This is E. coli causing urine tract infection or whatever. Um, and, and don't actually look in the light of the wider context in terms of evolutionary history and, and ecology. And so we called this uh, the eco-evo view. And basically one way of thinking about this is this is a, a step, another step away from this kind of anthropocentric view that we are the center of the universe and that was kicked away by Copernicus and Darwin and others. Uh, we tend to think, you know, we are, when we have infections, those infections are there to cause trouble for us and the bacteria have some special relationship with us. In fact, for many bacteria, they're actually relating to all sorts, interacting with all sorts of other organisms out there. Um, and many of the uh, virulence factors, the things that help them cause disease in us, are actually, have actually evolved in other contexts, in, in terms of these other relationships. So you have predatory bacteria. Uh, this picture here is a Bedello vibrio, which is a kind of predatory bacterium which swims around and then burrows into the side of E. coli, chews a hole in it, colonizes the periplasm, and eats the E. coli from within and lives on the E. coli as its food source. Now, you can argue that capsules, obviously capsules, these are a virulence factor. When we look at, say, the survival of E. coli in the bloodstream when it's going to cause meningitis, that capsule is clearly important to virulence. But you could also argue that that capsule is helping it uh, prevent uh, predation by these predatory bacteria, helping it uh, avoid being uh, uh, predated on by bacteriophages and so forth. You know, we have predatory protozoa, in addition to predatory bacteria. We have interactions with flies and plants and with, uh, fungi and with worms. Uh, and uh, in, in that sense, interactions with humans is just one small part of the, of the kind of bacterial world. Now, you might say, well, I'm getting a bit arcane here. You know, why is that at all relevant? You know, okay, maybe that's what happened millions of years ago, but what, what about now? Well, it, interestingly, people in recent years have actually started looking towards non-mammalian systems as models of infection. So you might think, well, actually trying to model infection of humans in a caterpillar or in a fruit fly or in a, um, a zebrafish is a bit odd. And a bit of a stretch, but given this context that we know that many of these virulence factors have evolved in those uh, interactions with those kind of animals, it actually starts to make much more sense. And this is a, a review uh, which uh, covers this issue uh, pretty well, looking at how you can use these alternative uh, things. You know, people usually think, oh, you have guinea pigs, you have mice, you do experiments on them. But in fact, there's a lot of interest now in these kind of systems, particularly because you can adopt high throughput approaches. So if you're looking at uh, C. elegans, for example, nematode, you, know, you, could, you could actually grow them up in a microtiter format and you can screen them, uh, various mutants against them and so forth, in, in a high throughput format where you can do 100 at a go and then you stack them up and you maybe do 1,000 of these in, in, in a single run, that kind of stuff. In fact, it's even... Uh, got to the stage where people are using yeast as a model of human infection. Um, you might say, again, this is that's a bit, a bit of an odd, isn't it? A bit of a stretch. But because of this evolutionary perspective, it, it's clear that there is a kind of common, that what bacteria are doing when they target um, intracellular components, signal transduction pathways, and so forth, they're actually looking at a very a common cool toolkit that's common to all eukaryotes. Uh, signal transduction pathways, cytoskeleton, and so forth. And in fact, many of the same targets are present in yeast. Uh, we do share uh, similar signaling pathways, you know, the RAS family, all those kind of things, cytoskeleton. There are actually com shared components in yeast. And bacterial virulence factors that actually are active in human cells can actually have effects on yeast. And the great thing with yeast is that you can um, do this in a real high throughput you can make libraries of, say, bacterial virulence factors in the yeast and then screen them uh, 
for, say, growth retardation. So just something as simple as the, the yeast cells are growing more slowly than the wild type is enough to tell you that you have a bacterial protein being produced in that yeast cell which has an effect on um, the eukaryotic uh, kind of cellular toolkit. I'm just going to swerve to one side into a bit more detail here and just give you a case study, uh, which I think is quite interesting, uh, to get you thinking in kind of evolutionary terms. We used to have a whole lecture on evolution of virulence, but I'm just going to spend five or ten minutes of this lecture talking about this here. So if we look at uh, STEC, so STEC is sugar toxin producing E. coli. It's one of several what we call pathotypes of E. coli that causes di diarrhea, it causes disease in the gastrointestinal tract. Now, classically in the past, uh, this used to be uh, all down to E. coli 0157H7, a particular serotype, caused a lot of problems, big outbreak in Japan, big outbreak in America, so the jack-in-the-box outbreak associated with uh, Hamburg has caused problems here in, in this country, in Scotland, there was a big outbreak. But more recently, we've seen the emergence of other serotypes, and some of you may have been aware that over the summer there was this outbreak in Germany with a serotype 0104H4. Um, some of these uh, sugar toxin-producing E. coli have a type 3 secretion system, uh, a particular dedicated uh, virulence determinant. Those are sometimes bracketed in the term uh, EHEC, or enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Here's a, just a model of the sugar toxin there. You can see it's got this uh, AB5 structure with an active site uh, uh, and uh, some binding domains. Active, so, so, you know. If we look at classical EHEC, though, or, uh, and maybe STEC in general, we have to ask ourselves the question, why on earth does this organism have all these virulence factors, including the sugar toxin, which are active in human infection, when in fact this infection doesn't spread from one human to another very readily? Certainly not enough to sustain this infection in our populations. So usually this infection is coming from outside through, through the food chain. Typically, with typical EHEC, it was uh, it's commensal of cattle, um, and uh, this is coming into the food chain because either vegetables or meat are getting contaminated with cow feces. So you could argue, well, these things that are causing disease in us are actually colonization factors in the cow. The cows don't get sick, but these are the things necessary for them to survive in the cow gut. Um, in fact, with this German outbreak, it doesn't appear to be any link to, to, to cows at all. Uh, and it, so it's not clear you know, that, that you always have that situation. The sugar toxin isn't always coming from, oops, coming from a background where you've got um, cattle. Another explanation, though, is that maybe it's not dealing with the cattle, with the cow gut itself. It's dealing with micropredators in the cow gut. So that in the in the intestine of the cow, there are all these bacteria, but there are also predatory protozoa uh, in there. Um, and an interesting paper that came out a few years ago kind of looked at this, uh, looked at grazing or predatory protozoa, and showed that the sugar toxin encoding prophage, which uh, carries the, the gene uh, for, for, for sugar toxin in E. coli 15787, actually had a, an, a, 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 provided a selective advantage to bacteria when they were being predated, pred, 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 predated, predated on by, um, preyed on by uh, these predatory protozoa. So that kind of provides an angle on this. And in fact, I had a paper a few years ago also where we looked at E. coli 157. We found that a lot of the Effectors of virulence encoded, uh, well, that the trans, the, uh, the, the, are translocated through this type 3 secretion system actually also are encoded by genes on, in bacteriophage. Um, and so it, it's a common motif that we see that bacteriophages have these virulence factors encoded in them that help the bacterial hosts, which the bacteriophages live in, uh, in their interactions with eukaryotes. So it's kind of a, a bit of a, a mystery as to why that should be. It requires some explanation. Um, this is what we found in our study, and I showed you this slide yesterday as well, these lambdoid profiles, profiles that are similar uh, in their morphology and genetics to lambdophage, actually have at one end of the profiles genome these effectors. 
So you can argue that once those phages are integrated into the genome of the bacteria, if you remember, we said this yesterday, that sometimes that happens, that the phage genome, uh, instead of the phage coming in and hijacking the cell and turning it into a factory just to produce more phage, sometimes the phage genome just in, is, is uh, um, stapled into the, into the chromosome of the bacterium and just becomes uh, a part of the bacterial genome for many, many generations. So when that's happening, you can argue, well, it's part of the genome of the bacterium. What benefits the bacterium is benefiting that prophage. The two things go together, so it kind of makes sense, doesn't it, that the uh, prophage is actually helping the bacterium by bringing in these virulence factors. And that's probably true for these type 3 secretion effector genes that we found in our study a few years ago. But there's a twist in the tail for here for this because the sugar toxin is actually encoded on a phage, but it only is produced, uh, the, the gene is only expressed and the, and, and the protein only made when that phage has actually gone from being a prophage and gone into the lytic phase of its life cycle where it started to make many, many copies of the phage uh, and is starting to destroy the cell in which it lives. So in a sense, the sugar toxin is like a suicide bomber. The, the sugar toxin only gets released from the cell when that lysis is, com is completed and the phage has hijacked the cell and destroyed the cell and lies the cell. Um, and so in that sense, you've got this question, of how, how then can the bacterium benefit from having this uh, phage-encoded uh, toxin when it, the bacterial cell is destroyed in the process of releasing the toxin. So again, it's, it's an interesting uh, kind of, uh, conundrum. And, and there is no clear answer to this that everyone's settled upon, but perhaps uh, the most interesting explanation, a compelling explanation, is that in fact what's going on here is the phage actually, if you like, is eating E. coli, it lives on E. coli, and it's producing a toxin which actually sees off other organisms that also are pre pre preying on E. coli, eating E. coli. So if you like, these predatory protozoa are also living on E. coli, and the phage is seeing them off by killing them off and allowing it to have all of the E. coli to itself. That may be one explanation. The other explanation is perhaps that lysis isn't all or none phenomenon. It's not the whole population is lysing and releasing the toxin. An, an alternative explanation is that if maybe one in a hundred cells is releasing toxin by, by committing suicide, it's actually benefiting the other 99 cells that are genetically identical to it. And so there's this kind of kin selection uh, for bacteria. But we don't really have a clear model of this. I'm just kind of pointing out, I think this is very interesting. Anyway, let's, where are we up to? Yeah, we're still we're doing fine for time. The second part of this talk is not looking so much at what, is, what, what genes look like and how, how the genetics work in bacteria. It's, it's actually how can we use genetic approaches to understand virulence and, and to get a handle on it more efficiently. Uh, how can we use genetic modification and, and so forth to understand pathogenesis. So let me just reinforce, again, this is not repetition, it's reinforcement of what we taught you yesterday. The key starting point for using genetics to understand virulence comes from, from Stanley Falco, 1988, when he put forward these molecular Cox postulates that if you want to, to understand in, uh, and use genetics to understand uh, virulence, what you do is you knock out, you choose a candidate gene, it's got something you think is associated with phenotype, you knock the gene out, you see that virulence phenotype disappear, you put the gene back in again, the virulence phenotype comes back. But if, you know, let's say we've got an E. coli and we've got 4,000, or salmonella, and we've got 4,000, more than 4,000 genes in the genome, and we want to understand, we want to get a global picture of virulence in that organism, it's a lot of effort to go through and make 4,500 mutants or 4,000 mutants. Uh, and then to not only assay them all, but then to go back and complement them all, you know, that's a major piece of work. Um, doing it one at a time. For some organisms, the E. coli K12, the, the, the common lab strain, people have actually done that. You can actually get mutants in every one of the four and a half thousand genes, uh, the so-called KO collection. But you, know, you can only do that 
on very rare, um, high-profile kind of model strains. You can't do that more generally. So there's been a lot of interest in actually moving faster forward uh, with this kind of stuff. And um, about 15 years ago, uh, this uh, area took a, a, a big step forward with the, the, the um, invention of what we call signature tag mutagenesis. So this was invented by guy David Holden, who is now a professor at Imperial College and one of the <coughs> most eminent bacteriologists in the country. And he invented this, uh, what's known as a negative selection method. Uh, and, and the idea was to try and work out which genes are essential under a given condition. So let's say, as I said yesterday, how you define virulence is something of a philosophical issue, it's a fuzzy issue. But let's say you wanted to define virulence as um, survival during infection in animal tissues, and that things that contributed to survival in animal tissues you would call virulence factors. Let's say you wanted to be slightly more sophisticated than that and said that things that are re required for survival in animal tissues but perhaps are not necessary for survival, that, that, that are not necessary for survival on laboratory media are what you're going to call virulence factors. So things like the ribosome, which are required in both settings, you're not interested in. You're interested in just comparing what's required to live in the lab with what's required to survive within animal tissues. So the way this approach works is that you uh, make a library. Um, you, you can introduce a transposon into uh, population of cells, and the, the transposon will jump randomly into different genes and uh, insert itself. And so you can make a library where you've got uh, these insertions randomly in, in all the different genes throughout the chromosome. Having done that, you then propagate those uh, cells on the on laboratory media, and for you to be able to grow those mutants once you've got the transposons gone into the, uh, into the chromosome, obviously they have to be capable of surviving on laboratory media. So any genes which are absolutely essential for viability, will, you won't have in your library. They will not, be, uh, will not survive. But you'll have a set of all the genes which um, are not uh, essential for survival in laboratory media, but might be essential for growth in vivo. And the neat trick that David Holden introduced here was that he actually tagged each of the transposons. He made a, 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 a tag where he put these uh, primer sites on the end of each um, uh, transposon with a different tag. Um, and so, so there's this, an invariable primer site, which is the same in all of your transposons. And then you have a little bit nested in, which is variable, which is a tag. Like a barcode, if you like. And so you end up with this creation of a complex mixture of uh, DNA signature tags. So you might have 96 of these, or you might have 384 of these. And those are incorporated into the transposons, and then the transposons are used to make this transposon library of bacteria. The key point here is that you can then pool those mutants. Yeah, and so you can take a hundred of them in one go and mix them all together and you can then infect an animal with that pool. Say you took a hundred uh, mutants in one go, you can put them into the animal, uh, so you put them into a mouse <coughs> and then you can, maybe a day later or two days later, after the infection has established itself in the mouse, you can sacrifice the mouse, you can ha harvest the mouse organs, say the mouse liver, and you can then uh, propagate out. This, let's say this, this was initially done in salmonella. Let's say. So, so you propagate out the salmonella cells from the, from the liver, and you can then look to see what has survived in your pool. So you start off and spot out DNA from each of your mutants. So here we've only got six in this pool here. Uh, but normally you'd have, say, 96. You get pool, put into the mice. You took the input pool here, you can hybridise your input pool to your filters here, and all of them should be represented, because that's what you started with. 
We then recover the bacteria that survived in the mouse, and that represents your output pool. But there will be some genes which have been knocked out by your transposon, uh, which encode uh, determinants which are essential for survival in the mouse, even if they're not required to grow on an agar plate. And they will drop out of that pool. So when you recover the bacteria back out again, you'll have a gap in your pool that wasn't there in the input pool. So in this simple example here, where we've only got six in the, in the pool, one of them's dropped out. Uh, and so when you hybridize here, you'll have a gap there where one thing does not give you a hybridization signal. Um, and the great thing about this is that instead of, if we wanted to survey, let's say, 4,000 genes, instead of having to use 4,000 mice, you know, make a mutant, put it in a mouse, see what effect it has on the mouse in terms of the virulence in, in the mouse and so forth. Instead of doing 4,000 mice, or probably you'd have to do it in, in replicate, you might use 5 or 10 mice for each experiment. Instead of using 40,000 mice, you're actually uh, using a hundredfold less. So you could take your 4,000, oh here we go again, it's running out of power again. Luckily this time. Yes. Um, and so instead of using 4,000 mice, you can get away with, say, 40 mice to survey the entire chromosome of a bacteria and, and actually look at every cell, uh, every, every gene within the cell, within the chromosome. So, has everyone followed me up till now, or is that clear as mud? Happy? Okay, so... In more recent uh, years, there's been developments that take these technologies even further. So there is this thing called, now called TNSeq, where you actually do high throughput parallel sequencing for fitness and genetic interaction studies in microorganisms. Um, so this is the abstract I put up here from this paper in Nature Methods. Um, and what this is looking at is you take a particular transposon, this is known as a mariner transposon, um, and which goes in nice and randomly into the genome. Um, and you can then uh, identify which genes have been interrupted by the uh, transposon by actually sequencing the flanking regions en masse. So this rel relies on a new development that's come in, in the last five years or so called high throughput sequencing where you can very quickly and easily in the lab sequence thousands and thousands of sequences in one run. In fact, more than that, millions in some cases. Um, so let's just see how this works. So the first part is just like STM. So you make a transposon library constructed in vitro, in the laboratory, transformed into the bacterial population. And each bacterium will have a single transposon insertion. That's just part of the way you set it up and the way the, the, the transposons work. You then take a pool of, of those uh, mutants and you isolate DNA from that input pool. Uh, you then apply some kind of selection to the pool. So then you could inject it into a mouse. In fact, these technologies don't just work with injecting into a mouse you can apply any kind of stress or any kind of different environment to the, the pool. You don't have to actually use whole animals. You could say, let's look at what happens with heat stress or acid stress uh, and apply that to the pool. You, do, you then get an output pool of, of bacteria and you isolate DNA from that. But then instead of doing this hybridization and PCR and hybridization that we did uh, with STM, what you do is you amplify up using PCR 160 base pair sequence, 20 base pairs of which is specific to the insert. Um, and what we do is this massively parallel amplified sequencing where we can sequence thousands and thousands of sequences in one sequencing run very easily uh, and quickly. And 20 base pairs from those, those sequences that you've, you've amplified up in sequence actually show you where the transposon has gone into the genome. And that can be mapped to the genome. And 20 base pairs is enough for you to unambiguously assign that insertion within the genome. Um, that's enough. And, and you can then count how many 
insertions there are in each gene and where they are, and you can look at the effect, fitness effects for each of the genes. Now that's verbally. Let's just walk through a diagram now to explain it more. So we make our uh, transpose on here. It actually has, one thing I didn't say in the verbal description, it has this restriction site on it, um, which cuts uh, where, where the restriction enzyme recognizes that site and then doesn't actually cut at that site but cuts 20 base pairs downstream from it. So you put this into the genome, you do your pool, make your pool, you put it through this, the, the selection, get the output pool and so You then harvest the genomic DNA and you cut the genomic DNA with this restriction enzyme, which cuts the DNA at 20 base pairs away from uh, where the insertion has gone in. So it's basically harvesting the insertion, the, the transposon, and 20 base pairs of adjacent chromosome. You then add adapters to that pool that you've got, and then do the PCR on that, and you end up um, with the flanking at the end of the transposon, and then 20 base pairs of the flanking region, and then try to use as an adapter. And that's how you basically then do the mapping uh, onto the chromosome, and you end up being able to work out. Um, which genes have been disrupted and which ones have not. Now, it's kind of interesting that it's often the case in science that when an idea, uh, when, when time has come for an idea, an idea's time mm -hmm. has come, you get several people coming up with the same thing. So that uh, TNC paper, within a matter of a, a few months, by this paper, which describes a very similar approach, this is from uh, the Sanger Institute, primarily. Uh, they called it TRADIS, uh, uh, just with a slightly different name, Transpose and Directed Insertion Site Mapping. Um, but they did something very similar, where they actually uh, went in and um, PCR'd up these, uh, um, uh, well, they mapped these uh, transpose on unique transposal insertion sites to the salmonella typhi genome. <coughs> Here they actually looked at um, what happened when you applied uh, bile salt stress to the bacterium. So you grew the bacterium in a nice, happy medium where it's happy and, and grows well, and then you put grow it in a medium where it's, it's exposed to, to, to bile, um, and so they were able to see which genes were actually uh, required for survival in the bile, um, and which ones were superfluous. So here I've reproduced some of the uh, figures from that particular paper. Um, and at the top there, you can see this is a map of the whole chromosome. And the, um, the graph is showing you there the frequency of reads that are mapping to particular locations. So you can see that although, as part of, of this process, the transposons have to, we have to accept that transposons are going randomly into the genome. They're being pasted into the genome all the way across, randomly. But once you've actually then taken that pool of mutants and put them through this, this biostress, you see it's not random. There are some parts of the genome where you get lots and lots of insertions, i.e. these parts of the genome are not necessary for survival in the biostress. Uh, whereas in other parts of the genome, you don't get any insertions. So these are genes which are either essential in all conditions or are essential uh, in the, in the bio sorts. And you can compare, again, the input and the output pool to work out um, which of those two things it is. So if you look here, here, you can actually map this now right down to the level of individual genes. So here he's looking at a series of uh, genes there. And you can see this gene pass C there are no insertions in that gene. And that, that is telling us that that gene has to be intact for the cells to survive during the bile stress. Whereas if you look in some of the adjacent genes, you can see that there are insertions. Here there are lots of insertions. And you can also see that between the coding sequences, insertions are actually quite common as well. So in promoter regions or in the regions between promoters and terminators, uh, there, there's it's permitted to have these inser insertions. And you can see the same thing down here. You've got some genes here, lots of insertions, some here, uh, either none or very few. And 
And so you're getting here not just a pattern of what's essential and what's not essential, but also a more of a quantitative feel for, well, it's, it's useful, it provides uh, some fitness advantage under this condition, not absolutely essential, but basically it is selected again. So this one here, well, you, see, you see there are some insertions, but they're very, very low frequency uh, compared to what you see elsewhere. And this, um, if you do serial passages, you take that same pool and you put it through the stress once and then you extract DNA and see what's happened and then you put it through the stress again, passage and passage and passage, you see changes over time. So um, some genes that, that, that initially looked as if they were um, uh, important and, and didn't have any insertions in, over time, they actually, the cell may have adapted, it may have acquired mutations, compensatory mutations, and so forth, that allow it to better survive in, in, in bile, uh, but actually render some of those genes no longer useful. So over here, you've got the flagella, a flagella gene offer, uh, gene offer on here, where at the first passage, when it's gone through, actually the flagellum is still being made, these are still useful, but there's obviously been some mutations which switch off flagella biosynthesis and it's no longer necessary, no longer useful. And then you can see that the whole operon starts to acquire mutations pretty swiftly. So that's me finished for today. That was just taking you through a whistle stop to bacterial genetics. Uh, we've looked at bacterial ge why genetics is different in bacteria, definitions of terms, role of horizontal gene transfer, origins of virulence genes and genetic methods for assaying virulence. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I managed to finish on time today. Okay, well, I'll see you again tomorrow then.